Well, good morning, everybody, and I hope you're uh, all keeping well. Um, this is my uh, wait for somebody to finish unwrapping their suite. OK, um, <laughs> this is my uh, uh, penultimate week, I guess, probably here in Chicago. I've uh, got one more week to go and then I'll be back in the uh, UK as as normal. Um, I think our plan is to return here uh, sometime towards the end of November. Uh, for another month, but I'm not really certain. I'll just take my, my orders from my wife and I'll do whatever she tells me to do, as a good husband should. Isn't that right, Nick? Um, yeah. <laughs> right, OK. So... <laughs> message Debs and ask her. Uh, right, OK, so I think uh, with me today I've got Gareth. Hi, Gareth. Hello. And I have Liz. Hi, Liz. Hi. Uh, is Naomi, are you on? Yep, I'm here. Hi, Naomi. And uh, I think uh, uh, Laura is, is bogged down in converting from uh, her, her current system to a new system. Uh, every time I speak to her, she appears to be crying. Um, so <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think she'll be on today. Um, uh, they'll have sent her the telephone number for the Samaritans. Uh, just <laughs> stop her from ringing me. Um, and uh, <laughs> I know that's cruel. Um, and um, yeah, uh, Kevin's not with us either. He's um, he's involved in in something or other. I, I don't really know. It probably involves watching animals or herding people. I'm not really certain. Right. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, so let's let's uh, let's crack on. Um, actually, we wanted to do we want to have a go at doing a poll this week just to see whether we can do polls. Uh, and for anybody new, by the way, just raise your hand and I'll open the lines, or Nick will open the lines to uh, to invite you invite you in to make your comments, or you can type them into the message box as as normal. Um, we want to just start with asking about conference because conference is on in two, three weeks time. Is that correct, Nick? Conference? I believe is next week. Is it next week? Oh, yes, it is next week, isn't it? If I um, have... <laughs> uh, uh, time, time, time is a mystery to me now. I've completely lost track of who I am, where I am, who <laughs> I am, what time it is. What we'll time it is somewhere else? Uh, it's, it's just complete mystery. Yes. So next week, Nick, we're we, we're having a stand. Uh, no, I'm not going to be there because I'm here. You're you're going to be on the stand. Who else is going to be on the stand? Well, I'll be on the stand with a a, a new face in in Bessie. Jimbo will be joining us, and we have Sue popping up <coughs> on the first day. People might know Sue from Cheshire West and Chester, and we have uh, Peter. Coming on Thursday, uh, people might know from uh, from policy and practice. So yeah, it should be a good couple of days. Obviously, everyone come over. There's competitions galore. Um, so come and come and take part, please. It'd be good to see everyone physically. Uh, and we've, what's what's our main prize at the conference this year? <sighs> Depends what you're into. I mean, we've got we've got software to give away this time, haven't we? Uh, okay. And if people are after a birthday present for the Partner, child, um, whatever you're into, we, we might be chucking a PlayStation 5 somewhere as well if we want to win that. <laughs> wow. So, so, so we yes. can tell. Might be worth We can tell that the, uh, that the the software worth many thousands of pounds is not as interesting as the PlayStation 5. <laughs> yeah, it isn't either or. PlayStation wins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they can enter both competitions though, can't they? <laughs> They can, yeah, yeah, they can. They can have a go. Well, this, this sounds, this sounds like a, a prize that goes either congratulations, you've won a, you won a plane stage five, or unfortunately, you've won the software. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. So. Part, what I will say to the to the older generation, part of the prize draw is a Willy Wonka style chocolate bar. So you may well find, and I actually watched. With my sick year on Saturday morning at 6:30 a.m., Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. 
for, for some random reason. He'd watched it the day before. So, uh, yeah, we are giving away chocolate with a, with a golden wrapper in it. So, excitement there. Yes, that will be, be all Can't about. Wait. Okay, I'm going to try and launch the poll. We want to know how many of you are going to the conference this year and which way are you, you going ahead. So, I'm going to try this poll, see whether this works. Is, is that live now? Can people see it? No, I can't. Yes, it's popped up on my screen in the middle yeah. of the forms poll. MS forms poll with three options. Are you going to conference this year? Yes, I'm going to Telford. Yes, I'm doing the virtual thing or no. I think people press it, didn't they, Malcolm? They do, yes. They, they tick whichever one they want. And Nikki's just suggested that uh, uh, it depends depends whether she can get any petrol or not. Gareth, are you are you going to the IRRV poll uh, poll mm -hmm. <laughs> conference oh, this year? I, I shall be in Italy, I hope, and Easy. vanishing off next Sunday. Now that must have been a tough choice, Italy or Telford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Telford's an easy drive. <laughs> <laughs> are you driving to Italy? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, we are. I, I should even be able to st still dial in as, as I go along to you as well. So, uh, Excellent. Uh, would you be doing it in Italian? Uh, well, no. <laughs> um, probably not. You would give me enough trouble if I try and do it in Welsh. So my Italian is much worse than my Welsh. Okay. Uh, right. OK, so I can see that 33% of the people who are on this call are going to go to conference, hopefully all going to come and visit us on our stand. 8% uh, are doing the virtual thing and 54% uh, aren't going at all in any shape or form, which is, uh, which is interesting. I'd quite like to dive into that a little bit. But anyway, we won't do that today. We've got uh, some things to talk about. All right, OK, let's get that off the screen and let's move through the agenda. Right, OK, I'm not doing the stats today because uh, we haven't managed to update them. And we're not doing Kevin's uh, uh, briefing either because he's not here. Um, so we'll go straight into a discussion on really these kind of two linked subjects here, uh, the DHP challenge and subsidy. So um, on the DHP challenge, my question is, if how are you going to or how are you planning to manage your DHP, DHP spend under the new regime? And what does this say for the future of DHPs? Does this signal a move to take DHPs from LAs and centralise it or redirecting it to regional government? I guess, Naomi, is, you're the only local authority person on the panel today. Uh, what, what's, what's your view? Um, <clears throat> I don't think... DWP can give DHPs to anybody else. Um, it's a bit of a poison chalice. I don't think anyone's going to be rushing forward and saying, give it to me, give it to me. <clears throat> um, by and large, local authorities have done pretty well, um, bearing in mind that DHPs are the band-aid for every welfare reform going. Um <clears throat> So I think we're stuck with it, but I think we're also therefore stuck with um, challenges on how we spend what we don't know we're going to get until about half an hour before the start of the financial year. Um, we have always spent our DHP. We've had um, some homelessness prevention money previously and it's about to run out <clears throat> so we're having to put a bid in uh, for some cash to tide us over um, because we we actually feel it's a worthwhile thing to do it really does support people and it runs along very nicely with our um, other welfare support that we do but it's not easy and, and the new funding arrangements where you've got to spend a certain amount by by the half year point, does that 
does that like to give you a challenge or not? No, as I said, we, we always spend more than our um, government contribution. And so this year, <clears throat> out of the 40 million top up, we got £11,000 more than I extrapolated from our first funding, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Can I ask who actually are these people that only spend you know, less than 60% of the DHB funding at this kind of crisis time? Uh, Wales. <laughs> uh, so is that, I, I, have, I haven't looked the figures up so um yeah i mean wales normally the welsh authorities normally take i mean it's not i mean obviously there's quite a few welsh authorities but i mean normally when you look at the figures uh quite a number of them uh, get criticized i mean um I, I can't remember who it is now but there's there's one of the charities almost as soon as the figures are are published uh, immediately starts to name and shame the Welsh authorities uh, who have underspent. But actually, when when I've spoken to those Welsh authorities, it's it's not been for the want of trying. Um, they just haven't had the take up uh, to 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 spend it. And I think that's probably true of the um, uh, the numbers of of local authorities in England as well. Um, there's one or two that I know, which I, I won't name, who, who feel, sorry, who's ever phone that is, can they answer it please? Um, yeah, there's one or two English authorities who who clearly think that they're, the job that they have with DHPs is not to spend them, but, um, but most local authorities I think try to spend. Be interested to hear from the audience, uh, you know, are you struggling to to spend it, or are you are you not struggling to spend it? We've got, we've got a couple of hands up, Malcolm Lynn. Yeah, got please. A few moments ago, and then we've got Helen to follow. Okay, let's let's speak to Lynn and then follow with Helen. Oh hi, um, I totally agree with Naomi that it belongs where it is. Um, from my experience, we also used to spend all of our government contribution, and then we had a top up from uh, our own pop, um, purse. But um, one of the things I had heard is that there may be plans afoot to move it into universal credit because obviously the majority of housing costs are paid in universal credit now um, for working age, certainly. But um, that's just something I'd heard on the grapevine. Um, I just wondered if anybody else had heard anything along those lines. Uh, I, I thought actually um, there was a now a, a, a fund for for job centres um, that was available to them, but I don't don't know very much about it. Uh, I can't see that, that it would fit in because most of the DHPs is spent because people have had their HB or the or their UC housing costs sort of cut. So you can't really see how you could work that one through. I think it was more on the line that obviously because um, if a local authority is looking into granting a DHP for somebody that's housing costs are in universal credit, it's sort of two separate pay channels in terms of that. And I think the discussion was around um, if the majority of DHPs are for um, people working age people renting in the private sector and getting those housing costs through UC, it would be making more sense to pay the DHP alongside the universal credit. Um, as I said, it's just something I've heard on the grapevine, not a lot of detail, unfortunately, um, but it, it was just quite interesting to consider that. And I, as I said, I just wondered if anybody else had heard about that. Okay, uh, if anybody has, if they could let us know. Uh, Nick, Helen uh, had a hand up. Yeah, go for it, Helen. Hi, yeah, um, I work for Conway Council in Wales and um, for 2021, yes, we overspent the DHP by 8k, but we were one of the local authorities that um, the PWP didn't give us, give us enough money, they, they shortchanged us by 54k. Um, I did try and get the 8k back off them but failed, um, which you'd expect really. 
And for 21-2, we're also getting funding this year from the Welsh Government. So Welsh authorities have had an opportunity to sign up with the Welsh Government for um, DHP funding. Um, but you can only claim it um, if you've spent the DWP allowance first. So that's new for this year. Yeah, I think Scotland works in a similar kind of way. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it has, has a similar kind of uh, top up. Uh, um, partially because in, in Scotland it, it's, it's regulated more centrally. Um, but I think spending spending DHP money first is is is, is the order of the day. Helen, I mean, they, this, do you, do you find it difficult to get people to take up? I mean, I have heard a number of Welsh authorities say, you know, no matter what they do, um, they have found it difficult to get people to to take up DHPs. I guess last year was a bit of an anomaly, but do you find that difficult? Not really, to be honest. Um, but what we do with the universal credit, so if somebody's on universal credit and applies, applies for a DHB, we look at the assessment period, we make a decision whether we're going to pay. And if we do pay, we then say to the customer, right, we'll look at your next assessment period to see if we can help you further. So we do that with the universal credit claims. But we don't have a problem um, spending the money. We do have lots of applications for people. And we also yeah. um, the homelessness people as well, um, you know, with helping deposits, rent in advance, etc. So you know we don't have a problem spending the money. And do do you do take up campaigns? No, no. We got it on the website, but we don't we don't actually do take up campaigns. No. Yeah, I think take up campaigns are a thing of the past. Now, but maybe no, a thing of the future true. as well. I go, go. That's not me, true. We, we we've just um, we just delivered. 215 online sessions for frontline workers in Wales uh, under the kind of the Dangles com campaign for the Welsh Government. And the idea behind that really is to encourage frontline workers in you know, whatever kind of area they're, they're in to talk to the people they deal with and to encourage them to uh, claim and take up their benefits. And actually, we put quite a lot of stuff about DHPs in those sessions. Is that, is that take up or is that awareness though, Gareth? Well, it, it, it's awareness for the frontline workers, but with the intention of encouraging take up for their clients. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'll I take, I take that point. I guess probably what I was thinking is, is in, in, the, in the olden days, local authorities actually ran campaigns, you know, over local radio and in newspapers in the days when we used to have newspapers and things like that. And that, that was the thing I was thinking is perhaps more well, I past. spent I spent many hours when I was working in a CAB pushing postcards through letterboxes yeah, in council estates in Cardiff, encouraging people to uh, to claim their benefits. The problem with take up campaigns now, though, is you don't have an easy route to the people that need it. Um, it's, for example, things like pension credit uh, and council tax reduction for for um, pensioners, where the real poverty is kind of. Uh, hidden in, you know, behind the hedges in the suburbs, you, you can't get it. A lot of people uh, very easily because they're not big social media users, and 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 they're not clustered together in ways that make physical take-up campaigns work. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I, I mean, again, you're absolutely right on that. I think pen pensioners are still a low take-up, surprisingly, it, despite the fact that. You know, a lot of pensioners of, of our age is, are, are media savvy, aren't we? And certainly IT savvy, you know, users of, of social media. But it's still, still going to take a while for that to filter through, I would think. I think it's also the more prosperous pensioners who are more likely to be social yeah. media users. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, again, that's, that, that's true enough. Uh, just, just just out of interest, Liz. Um, I mean, you, you've you've done a number of of these take up. You and I have done a number of take up campaigns in the past. But uh, DHP spend when you've been responsible for it. Have you disappeared, Liz, or you, you muted? 
Sorry, I'm unmuted now. Okay. I think the way forward is exactly as Gareth has described, actually. I think the days of putting things through doors and getting to the right people um, are probably over. It was never, I mean, to be honest, it was never particularly effective in the first place. Um, and I think the approach through partnership working is probably more successful and is certainly the way forward. Now, um, making sure that people are aware about DHP, by that I mean, you know, um, <clears throat> complementary services are aware of DHP. Um, on the other point, I mean, I I think it'd be quite difficult to see how DWP would even want to subsume it into universal credit. I mean, they're not that keen on making on making discretionary decisions anyway. Um, I just um, don't think that will happen. I'm interested about your point though about to regional government. By regional government, you mean regional government that's likely to be set up, such as uh, Greater Manchester and Greater London and places of that. Yes, uh, yes, mm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, because they they kind of look to the 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 national governments and see. Yeah, it'd be, see... Interesting. Mm. be interesting to know from a from the point of view of of our customers who trusts people what is the most trusted way of making these decisions do people actually see that dhp which is after all quite a personal decision in many ways i mean a lot of the information that you ask for is quite personal to that person who do they trust to actually make these decisions big government regional government or local government I don't know. Naomi, do you have a view? I think that local government out of all of those are definitely the most trusted. I think because it's the people who are closest, isn't it, that they do yeah. tend to be more trusted. Mm. This really goes back to where right at the very beginning about universal credit that there was a huge amount of um, do not put housing costs in universal credit because it's locality, it's the local authorities that know about the housing um, market within their area. You know, they've got trusted forums with landlords um, and all sort of partners and stakeholders. And um, I totally agree with Naomi that it is where it best sits absolutely and um i mean uh, the group that naomi and some other colleagues belong to in benex um put forward a huge amount of information to the select committee at the time and um the general consensus across many many local authorities was keep housing costs out but of course they haven't and i think that's caused huge problems but doesn't that cut to uh, another another kind of element in all of this which is that sometimes these decisions are not being made by you know with enough influence or by the frontline staff i'm not saying frontline staff don't try to influence but largely once it starts to move up the line to middle management upper management within the dwp or within local authorities elected members etc they kind of put their own spin on it rather than necessarily taking enough notice of, of what it's like on the front line. Welcome. Yes. We've had a, a, a comment and a, and a question raised by Marlene on the chat. Uh, she mentioned that they're having more and more applications for rent in advance and deposits, including RSLs. Uh, and she asked how other LAs on the call approach deposits and RAA for HA properties, do they pay? them routinely. Uh, Naomi, do you want to kick that off? <clears throat> uh, absolutely do not pay them routinely. Absolutely not. Um, we will work with the housing provider and the tenant to try and get sort of like a happy medium. Um, but there is no way that our DHP budget 
we'll we'll run to to that. What we're trying to do is to, you know, keep people in sustainable accommodation as well where they are currently, um, and just to hand out money to registered providers for rent in advance or deposits is not going to help that situation at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, Liz, when, when you were responsible for this, is this something you would have done? What, rent in advance and deposit? Not yeah. routinely. I think probably it is of more consequence now than it was a little while ago. But not, but, but not for so housing associations. Well, not unless there are particular and pressing circumstances under which you might do it. And does, has anybody else got a view on this from, from amongst the audience? Can we see Nick? Um, yeah, a couple of people have, have put stuff in there. Uh, Michelle's mentioned something. Marlene's suggesting uh, this interest if she posed a question, but she's saying she's pushed more and more to pay them. I'm not sure who that pushes from is that from higher ups or from no i think she's probably right it comes please. from sorry ali's got a hand up i think she's happy to have a chat now as well okay well i think it comes from pressure comes from house from housing departments from housing housing needs um on the grounds that of course primarily it is the prevention of homelessness mm. which is a yes. huge concern and is that wrong sorry marlene that's yeah. all right. No, um, I was just going to say just that, yeah, predominantly comes from the um, our housing team who kind of uh, push for those to be paid. Um, but yeah, we I, I just have a concern about kind of the overall budget, really, um, and keeping that for people like in the private sector as opposed to those in the social rented sector. I think obviously housing association is probably under pressure to... Um, get somebody kind of in a good position from the outset and I accept that but obviously when they're on universal credit um with like full housing costs I find it really difficult to kind of justify making that payment because they'll just be in credit I think so. I think the main thing though surely is that is working together yeah yeah no absolutely you know, that's something I weird. mean it, it's a joint solution really to some of these problems yeah yeah i think some of the ones you know that we do pay where they've been like rough sleeping i absolutely accept that that's kind of fully justified because they probably are a high risk tenant if you like but um i just find the more that you kind of open the door to it the more um registered uh, landlords basically say that that is required in order for somebody to move in um so yeah it's, it's a difficult one because i think the more, more of those that you pay um you know the more that impacts on your budget and the less money that you've got for kind of other areas really so yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's, we've got to work with our housing team and i think that's for us that's probably part of the problem because i think they see uh dhp as the solution for a lot of their cases you know right or wrongly but part, part of this is is a cultural thing isn't it marlene where the in the old days, the the or even with housing benefit, where where it's it's just paid automatically, it's covered by subsidy, it's paid automatically. There are no limits to it. It it just keeps on growing to fill the gap in terms of the budget. And the government certainly since two thousand and ten have been trying to move away. In fact, actually, even as far back as the under under Tony Blair. They were starting to try and move away from that kind of concept of unlimited unlimited money and moving to the these more departmental restricted budgets and that's difficult to convey that to 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 the housing department who are much more used to say you know housing benefit just being there and not seeming to grasp that you've only got a small pot in which to to make these payments yeah absolutely i think you know i think when dhp first came out it was kind of predominantly for shortfalls i think certainly for us rent in advance and deposit has shifted very much to be like the biggest lump of expenditure and yeah the new kind of the new one of those is 
you know, RSLs pushing for rent in advance to be paid um, and deposits. Not yeah. Do anybody else have kind of deposit schemes within their housing team? Because that's something we're kind of exploring. They, our housing department, have got a very restricted deposit scheme, um, and that doesn't include social sector. So, has anybody else got any kind of good schemes that their housing teams operate in terms of deposits? Yeah, that's, we're that's getting, that we're some good chatter in the in the in the meeting chat, Malcolm from People. So. I'm guessing people might respond to that, Marlene. Uh, just to cover a few, Malcolm, we've got uh, people suggesting they do get a lot of deposits, but they do look at them individually. Um, someone saying we pay some, not many. They don't cover RIA with DHP. Uh, someone else is saying they're referring back to housing options team. We normally get the RIA, RIA waived. Um, and Robert say very few for RSLs, most requests are in the private sector. So yeah, it's quite chatty today on the on the meeting chat. Okay, good, good. And I guess I guess probably uh, uh, there, there, there's been a bit of a swing, hasn't there, when the sort of let's call them the new DHPs or the increased budget DHPs were largely set up to deal with some of those welfare reforms, particularly bedroom tax, and that's kind of swung away from that now. Am I right in thinking that, Naomi? Um, <clears throat> we we do have some of the sort of more traditional ones, but what we're trying to do is to um, do sort of carrots and sticks so that we will pay a DHP if um, there's work with the applicant and the landlord to try and improve circumstances going forward. We have something called an HB plus where we're moving um, single men who've recently just sort of come off the streets and paying the top up from the LHA um, and that's been really successful because the people signing up for it have quite quickly gone and found jobs and they're actually coming off benefit um, so we're really trying to use it not just as a pay it out every week but as an investment so that we pay it for say three six months with the hope and expectation that at the end of that six months it's not going to be needed at all. And I presume that the business case for something like that is is to play it up against the costs of if you didn't do that kind of thing. If they stayed in a um, particularly a council hostel, cost the authority a shed load. Mm -hmm. Right. OK, uh, Nick, anything more from the uh, from the message boards there? Uh, nothing specific. Lynn's, Lynn's mentioned that from experience, most successful DHPs were private tenants with LH, LHA shortfalls and welfare reform impacts like bedroom tax. But yeah, we've, we've, we've stopped now. OK. Uh, Gareth, I mean, you've been listening to this from your from the outside listening in. What, what springs to mind for you from this conversation? Difficult to say, actually, Mark. I mean, from, from our perspective, the, the DHPs uh, are there as a really valuable contribution to the fact that increasingly, and I really mean increasingly, numbers of people, because of things like the two child limit, the overall benefits cap, um, the uh, really unmarket related LHA figures and so on, and of course the bedroom tax, don't get enough money in their you know, universal credit or, or legacy benefits to meet the rental needs. I mean, it's, it's pretty much impossible if you were a, a three child family anywhere in Wales, um, paying a social rent not to be capped. So, so the, mm -hmm. the DHPs are, are there as a kind of, thank God, um, you know, there's a chance of getting people enough money to actually meet their rental needs, even though the reason that the DHPs are there is just to partially compensate for or other cuts. But in terms of the way in which they're administered, I, I think there are two areas, aren't there really? One is the you know, like the longer term need for, for, for something like a DHP to meet the ongoing shortfall that people have got in their income. Um, and the other is those effectively one-off payments, the things like deposits um, that, that really are a different kind of issue. And, and maybe the DHPs 
uh, ought not to be a single pot meeting or trying to meet two needs. Yeah, and I, 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 it just strikes me as well is that, you know, there's probably a big argument for for increasing the payments at source, you know, at, at universal credit or whatever. Once you add the administrative cost of administering the DHP on top of everything else, it's it, it is an argument to to sort of analyse the success of the DHP and actually maybe just, you know, cost it in to the to the original benefit. I also wonder, you know, are we expecting to see requests for DHP rise once the £20 is cut on the universal credit? Absolutely. <clears throat> Jumping in both feet first. Yeah, um, that's one of the rationales that we're putting forward for wanting some bid money. Mm. Uh, because when we do DHP calcs at the moment, you know, you take the whole household income, you take the whole household expenditure mm. and, you know, from next month, there's going to be an additional deficit of 20 quid. Yeah, and that, that's bound to drive right right across the board. Uh, Marlene, I'm kind of interested, are you, are you girding your loins for, uh, for the 20 pounds? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's one thing that we're considering, well, you know, looking at in terms of reviewing customers that are already getting DHPs that are kind of getting those long term ones or, you know, ones where there's a shortfall as opposed to like the one offs. And I'm just curious from, from everybody, do you get much challenges from from DHPs when you don't award either the, the amount people require or, or need? Only from my housing team. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that speaks speaks volumes. Is that the same for you, Naomi? Sorry, um, can you repeat that last bit? Yeah, are you getting many challenges from uh, from the? Yeah, you know, when you don't award um, either, don't award or don't award as much as people feel they need. Um, no, actually, um, you know, we, we have a sort of internal review process that I'm part of, um, but I haven't been bothered by any recently, so that's OK. That's good. That certainly is good news. Uh, right. OK, I make it uh, 12.38 at the moment, uh, so maybe we won't go on to the question of subsidy as that's probably run run for a while and we'll, we'll do that one next week if that's okay with everybody is that all okay with you yep yeah that's good okay in which case i think probably this is a good point to to to, to wrap up um are there any other comments or anything else anybody wants to to add in the audience before we we close down just quickly <laughs> I would like to add the fact that I think there are real challenges for local authorities' decision making on DHPs coming up. Yeah, I, I some I really do hard choices. Well. Um, you know, people have spoken about um, uh, Naomi, I think, principally about you know making conditions <laughs> and trying to get people away from DHPs. Um, but I think the problem is that next year or after, you're going to have to consider whether it's worth paying a DHP at all. Because somebody will never be able to afford that rent unless they get a DHP. So how can you sustain that? All sorts of unpleasant decision making to be made, I think, in the I, perfect I storm that is coming our way. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you are setting yourself up um, yeah. by starting off with a DHP that is not going to achieve anything in the long run. If mm -hmm. you think that somebody is on the cusp of returning to work and additional support with a work coach would help. Exactly. Great. Um, but if not, or if they've got spare room subsidy issues and they're a, a household that could take in a lodger, work with them. But again, you know, if that's not sustainable, you cannot keep paying that money out. 
No, and that's that's the whole issue about that being a limited uh, uh, budget as opposed to the you know the never-ending budget of, of, of housing benefit, isn't it? And the exact reason why the government pushes along those lines. In many ways, local authorities can be the victim of their own success here um, because I think Treasury likes this kind of, of method of paying out welfare because it's cheap, it's really cheap for, for Treasury, um, but it's, it's quite expensive for local authorities to administer, I think. Absolutely. Um, so as it, it runs along the same thing as council tax reduction being, you know, localised. <clears throat> we, we've got no concept of how much we get given in our grants. Um, and I think for that particular reason, I wouldn't imagine DWP would want to touch it with a barge pole when paying out universal credit. Quite and agree. It's the Chinese curse. Be careful what you wish for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, on that basis, can I thank you all very much uh, for coming along today. Thank you very much to my panel, Naomi and Liz and Gareth. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. And, and thank you for the contributors uh, as well, Lynn and Marlene. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's been brilliant. Um, hopefully, and also for all the chatter on the on the line. Thanks to Nick for uh, for marshalling there. That's been brilliant. And I'll see you all uh, next week. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.